Well, as I've already mentioned, uh, we have been looking at how we are to love God. And we've seen the simple answer to that question is, as we all know, we are to love Him as Jesus loved Him. Now, our Lord Jesus showed His affection to the Father in many different ways, but not surprisingly, He did it by keeping the commandments. And again, I'll just remind you that the commandments are God's definition of love. That's, you know, Paul tells us that love is the fulfillment of the commandments. So, so far we've seen that Jesus in the first commandment took the true God, his Father. Uh, really, the, well, you know, one thing we have to bear in mind is that I think oftentimes when, when we say that Jesus took the true God to be his God, we mean that as a man he worshiped the true God. The true God is the triune God. In a certain sense, Son of God we know is, is he's worshiping himself in a certain sense. Um, and sometimes when you see the Father, uh, when, when the Father is mentioned, that may, what may be in mind there is really the triune God. We see the Father, we see Jesus Christ, and, um, you know, are they distinct? Well, yes, they're distinct persons, but, but they are the same God. So it may sound strange, but Jesus as a man devoted himself to God. He took the true God to be his God, devoted himself completely to him, loved him with, with all of his heart, mind, soul, and strength, and used his life to make his glory known. Jesus was always drawing attention to the Father and his glory. He glorified God, secondly, uh, the way that he lived. He, he lived according to the standard that God had given to him, both in his public worship and in the worship of his life. So Jesus lived not by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And, of course, Jesus treated the name of God and everything by which God revealed himself with the utmost respect, speaking his truth at all times and keeping his promises. And then we saw last week that Jesus also kept the fourth commandment by setting God's day apart, the day of rest. And we, we looked into all that that means with regard to its continuance and the change of the day, but that Substantially, essentially, the day remains the same because we need it. We need a day of rest. We need a day of worship. Well, Jesus kept that day of rest. He kept that day of worship. He met for public worship on that day. And the reason was that he might honor his Father and that he might seek his glory more intently. Again, the Sabbath is the market day of the soul. We need to immerse ourselves in the things of God on this day if we don't, we're, we're really never going to see God's glory as we should and experience His love in our hearts and lives as we should. It's a spiritual barometer. It tells us kind of where we're at, but it also, as it were, raises our spiritual temperature on this day. So we need to follow, really, Christ's example in, in all these different areas. Uh, if we are to love God in the way that, that God calls us to love Him, and, you know, again, that's the virtuous circle, isn't it? Because the more we love God, the more we give ourselves to love Him, the more we will love Him. We don't want to be content with asking ourselves day by day, do I really love God? Because it's only when we know that we love Him that we truly know that we belong to Him. Because that is the, what the Spirit of God produces in His, in His saving work, is this love. So we want to strengthen this love, but we also want to express it in the way he calls us to in our worship towards him. Well, this morning we're going to begin, and I say begin because we already kind of jump-started that a few weeks ago, looking at the fifth commandment. But we're going to begin thinking about how we are to love God as we move into the second greatest commandment, which is loving our neighbor. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Or as Dr. Ferguson, remember in that uh, series on the Sermon on the Mount, very helpfully put it, you shall love your neighbor as Jesus loved his neighbor, you know, because um, Jesus did it right, and we often do it wrong. So Jesus shows us how we are to love our neighbor as he loved himself. So we're going to start with the fifth commandment because that's where we break into the commandments having to do with how we love our neighbor. Now, as I've already told you, this commandment has to do broadly with respecting authority obeying the authorities that God has ordained and obeying them from the heart. 
that, that's where this father and son relationship comes in. Exodus 20, verse 12, honor your father and your mother that your days may be prolonged in the land which the Lord your God gives you. Now on the surface, it, it seems to be speaking really only of how we are to treat our parents. And I, I would imagine most of us understood it that way. And that's probably if we had Christian parents, how they taught us. Uh, it does that. Certainly it does that. As I said, we considered that a couple of weeks ago, but it's, it's much broader than this. Uh, these words, father and mother, are sometimes used in Scripture of those with authority in any of the, th the three spheres. And if you're not familiar with those terms, spheres of authority, um, I think it's something I want to say Kuiper may have uh, taught. He taught about the three spheres of authority that God has ordained in this world. He's given authority to each of the different spheres, which would be the family, and then the church, and then government, okay? Now, we know that this commandment speaks about how we are to treat our parents, and I've already mentioned that that changes as, as we change, uh, as we grow in, in, in life. When we're children, we are to obey them. Um, as adults, we are to continue to honor them, which means we are con to continue to give way to their words. You know, that's what honor means is is, you know, it has this idea of weightiness, and that simply means that you, you pay attention to what it is your, your parents are, are telling you. And, and there's limits to authority, I should mention that. We're going to come back to that in a minute. But we need to give weight to their words, and, and then when they're gone, when, when they've left this world, uh, we need to continue to honor their memories and give weight to what it is they have taught us. In other words, to follow that, you know, to follow that instruction, but again, within certain limits, as we'll, we'll see in just a moment. You know, interestingly, it also speaks to how servants are to treat their masters, remembering that servants in these days were also members of the household. Remember when Abraham was, um, received the covenant of circumcision? Um, all the men in his household received it because they were under his authority, they were in this relationship. Let me give you an example, and this one is a secular example that comes from the Old Testament. Remember when Naaman the Syrian, you know, by the way, we're reading Second Kings, so you can see why this one came to mind. When Naaman the Syrian went to Elisha to be healed of his leprosy, and Elisha told him to go bathe in the Jordan seven times, when he refused to do it, his servants in Second Kings 5.13 came near and spoke to him and said, My father, had the prophet told you to do some great thing, would you not have done it? How much more then when he says to you, wash and be clean? Notice the servants called him father. And the reason why they did that was because he was their authority. They were under his authority. Now, again, why these terms are used, we're going to look at in just a moment. Now, since it applies to servants and masters, it can also apply to employee-employer relationships. You know, not, not necessarily we're going to call them father and they're going to call us son, but it does tell us something about how we're to relate to them because during our work hours, we are the servants of our employers. You know, we still have servitude in, in our country. It's just limited you know, by, by time. And so during the time in which we are working, we are to honor them. We are to give weight to what they have to say. Where, do, where does the relationship of employer-employee or servants and masters fit in the Ten Commandments? Well, it fits right here. Paul writes in Colossians 3.22, Slaves, in all things obey those who are your masters on earth, not with external service, don't just put on a good show, as those who merely please men, and we have words for that, but I'm going to repeat those. But with sincerity of heart, fearing the Lord. Okay? Serve your master as you would serve the Lord. And that's, again, what this commandment is really all about. No, so it applies to the family. It also applies to the church. Leaders in the church were called fathers. Let me give you a couple of examples. 2 Kings 2.12, Elisha called Elijah, whom he served. Remember, he was sort of an apprentice under Elijah. 
my father, when he was being taken up into heaven, my father, my father, you know, as you saw the chariots of God and, the, you know, the armies of God. Joash, the king of Israel, called Elijah the same, 2 Kings 13, verse 14. See, if you read uh, 2 Kings, you're going to get a lot of instruction from this book. When Elisha became sick with the illness of which he was to die, Joash, the king of Israel, came down to him and wept over him and said, My father, my father, the chariots of Israel and its horsemen. The king of Israel is calling Elisha, the prophet, my father. So this is simply recognizing the authority in the church. And then what does Paul mean when he, when he writes to the Galatians, my children, with whom I am again in labor until Christ is formed in you. You know, I am your father in the gospel, he's saying, and you are my, my children. There's, there's a relationship here. And should they listen to Paul? Yes, they should. But with affection, which is, again, why these terms are used. And perhaps the area in which we don't like to hear about it, it also applies to the authority in the state. Listen to what the Lord said to his people in Isaiah 49, verse 23. Now, it may read differently in your more modern translations. And I got this from, you know, from my instruction years ago in the Westminster Larger Catechism, which I'm going to quote in just a moment. But it is a legitimate translation of Isaiah 49, verse 23. Kings shall be your nursing fathers, and their queens your nursing mothers. Again, calling authority in the state by the term father. And Ahaz, in 2 Kings 16, verse 7, when he was showing his submission to the king of Assyria, says this, I am your servant and your son. Now, the question arises, and it's a question that the Westminster Assembly asked, why, okay, why are superiors spoken of as father and mother? And their answer was this, superiors are spoken of as, as father and mother, both to teach them in all their duties toward their inferiors, like natural parents, to express love and tenderness to them according to their several relations and to work inferiors to a greater willingness and cheerfulness in performing their duties to their superiors as to their parents. So those in authority are called fathers and mothers because it's to remind them that they are to care for us as their children. And they're called, we're called their, their sons and daughters because um, you know, so that we'll be more willing to submit to them. It, it refers to an affection that we should have for one another. You know, this authority and submission to this authority is also to be a part of, of the love that we are to give to God and to our, and to our neighbor, right? It, we are to do everything in love. Okay, so the commandment is more broad. That's, that's what uh, this first point was all about. Now, secondly, we do need to submit to this authority for, for a couple of different reasons. First, because God ordained it. And secondly, because he ordained it for our good. By the way, we've already seen one other reason, and that is because those who exercise this authority are supposed to do it in love, and we are supposed to love them for the benefits we get from them. Okay, first of all, we need to remember that this, these three spheres of authority, these are not human inventions. Okay, these, these didn't come from a, a man's desire to dominate, you know, um, to usurp this authority, to try to get people under them so that they can make these people do what they want them to do. Now, there are many rulers who have used that authority in that way, but that's not how it came about. Okay, God ordained it. And because God ordained it, we are to submit to it because when we submit to it, we're actually submitting to him and not to man, right? Paul writes in Romans 13, 1, which you read earlier, every person is to be in subjection to the governing authorities for there is no authority except from God and those which exist are established by God. So this is God's authority. It's a delegated authority, but they rule by his authority, even if they don't know him, even if they're his enemies, even if they're completely secular, okay, that authority is still ordained by him, 
and it needs to be submitted to because of that. But then further, Paul says, the reason why God ordained it was for our good. God establishes authority that those who have that authority may use it for the good of others. Now again, as parents, they're supposed to care for us so that we might more willingly submit to them. But notice, they are to care for us. That's the good that God intends. Now, if I enlarge the family just a bit more, and I think, husbands, we need to be reminded of this from time to time. We, we have what the Bible calls headship. Man is the head of the wife. And typically, though not universally, men are stronger than women. And the question is, what are we supposed to do with that authority and that strength? Do we wrestle our wives to the ground until they submit to what we want them to do? Are we supposed to tyrannize them with this authority and this strength? Well, of course not. We are to love them. We are to serve them. We are to protect them in the same way that Jesus does the church. If you were to ask his, his disciples, did Jesus tyrannize you? The answer, of course, would be no. He loved me. And I will willingly serve him. That, that's the kind of relationship husbands are to have with their wives, to love them and to serve them and to protect them and to care for them and provide for them, okay? So that's what authority is for. Same thing with fathers and parents. We are to use our authority to serve our children, to teach them and to train them in godliness. You know, Paul writes in Ephesians 6, 4, fathers, do not provoke your children to anger but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. And of course, our greater strength is not to wrestle them to the ground either, but to protect them. And children, for their part, are to submit to their parents because their parents are laboring for their good. You know, one thing that's probably universally true, although maybe not universally, yeah, there, there are exceptions, but... You know, when, when you're children, you grow up and you reflect back on what your parents did, usually as young adults, you don't like it. You think they're wrong, wrong in every area, okay? I went through that phase. But then when you get older, you realize that what they told you was really true and it was right and it was wise and I should have listened to it in the first place. Well, same thing with uh, perhaps many of our children now. You know, they're not listening to the things we, we taught them, but really they should because the things we're telling them are good. Paul writes again in, in um, again, Ephesians 6, verses 1 through 3, children, obey your parents and the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and your mother, which is the first commandment with the promise, so that it may be well with you and that you may live long on the earth. Do you want a long life? You want, a, um, you want it to go well with you? I mean, what, what good is a long life if you're miserable? But if a long life coupled with Things going well with you, that, that's a blessing, right? Now, that's the kind of life Shirley had. And I think it came partly, well, it came from her love for the Lord, but also because she honored her parents. You know, she did what was right in God's eyes. Well, the same thing with church elders. They're given authority to instruct and to protect God's people. Remember what Paul said to the Ephesian elders in Acts 20, verse 28, be on guard for yourselves and for all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God which he purchased with his own blood. Now, they're laboring for our good, and that's why we need to listen to them. As the author to the Hebrews says in Hebrews 13, verse 17, obey your leaders and submit to them, for they keep watch over your souls as those who will give an account. Let them do this with joy and not with grief for this would be unprofitable for you. So exercise an authority on the good of the people of God and the people of God respond. And remember, th this is delegated authority. Parent, uh, elder, and as we're going to see in just a moment, state. And when we submit to it, we're submitting to God's authority, okay? Not, not to our parents necessarily. Okay, now the same is true for the state. They are not to tyrannize, but they are to protect those that they govern. Paul writes in Romans 13, verse 3 through 4, for rulers are not a cause of fear for good behavior, but for evil. Do you want to have no fear of authority? Do what is good, and you will have praise from the same. 
for it is a minister of God to you for your good. By the way, does that describe the governments we're familiar with? Okay, here we just need to think about this for a minute because this is what God requires of government, that they protect good behavior and encourage good behavior and that they punish evil behavior. That doesn't always happen, and we're going to see what, what we do in a case like that. But that is what they are obligated to do, right? And if they don't do it, they're going to have to answer to God for it. They're accountable just like the elders are accountable, just like parents are accountable, just like husbands are accountable. Now, Peter tells us, because they are for our good, we need to submit to their authority, and that when we do this, we're actually providing an argument for the Christian faith. 1 Peter 2, verses 13 through 17, Submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether to a king as the one in authority, or to governors as sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and the praise of those who do right. For such is the will of God, that by doing right, you may silence the ignorance of foolish men, act as free men, and do not use your freedom as a covering for evil, but use it as bond slaves of God. Honor all people, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king. Now, if the thought of submitting to our current government uh, gives you some you know, troubling thoughts, don't forget, in those days, the king, the one that's being referred to here, was Caesar. And he was a very, all the Caesars were very ungodly men. Now, with this authority, let's not forget, God has also given a means of discipline to teach, to give us an incentive to listen in these relationships. To parents, he's given the rod. He's given suspension of privileges, you know, given ways to modify behavior. Uh, to the church, various censures, such as warnings and rebukes and excommunications, such as what Paul said needed to be done to the man who had his um, father's wife in uh, the church of Corinth, 1 Corinthians 5, verses 1 through 5. And to the state, he has given the power of the sword. Paul writes in Romans 13, verses 3 and 4, But if you do what is evil, be afraid, for it does not bear the sword for nothing. For it is a minister of God, an avenger who brings wrath on the one who practices evil. Again, we have to kind of wonder, is that going on today? That's something we need to be praying for. Now, we are to submit from the heart, okay? That's the ideal situation. Submit to the authorities that God has ordained. But when we struggle to do this, we need to submit because the authority has, has some means of discipline to get us to do what's right if we should fail. Now, let's get to the part I think we all want to hear, okay? And that is limits to authority. There are limits, right? Whenever any of these authorities would try to compel us to do anything contrary to God's will, we are duty-bound, conscience-bound not to submit, but respectfully disobey. Respectfully disobey. That's one level, okay? When Peter and John were arrested by the Jewish leaders, in Acts 4, verse 18, they, were, they, they commanded them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. Well, that's something Jesus had commanded them to do. So now you've got two authorities, one telling you one thing, one telling you the other. Which one's going to win? Well, of course, Jesus will win. And so in verses 19 through 20, we read, Peter and John answered and said to them, Whether it is right in the sight of God to give heed to you rather than to God, you be the judge, for we cannot stop speaking about what we have seen and heard. And then later in chapter 5, verse 29, we must obey God rather than men. And that's when they called him in the second time because they didn't listen to him the first time. Hey, these, these Jewish leaders were leaders in the church. They were leaders, you might even say, in the government of Israel to some extent. And they could not listen to them because they were contradicting God. So any authority that tells you to do something that God has, has commanded you not to do, you've got to disobey them. Or if they tell you not to do what God has commanded you to do, you need to disobey them. 
So what is the right thing to do if our government tells us we may no longer worship God? We may no longer tell others about Christ. We're going to hear something about that this evening. The exclusivity of Christ, you know, that's what makes people upset. Not just one Savior among many, but the only Savior. Or that we must use our gifts, our services, our talents to support things that God tells us are sinful. Okay, I think we're all likely aware of the Christian baker who's still under fire because he refuses to bake a cake for a same-sex marriage or a photographer who refuses to take pictures of said event. Okay, they are being persecuted for refusing to use their talents to support these same-sex um, unions. Okay. Well, what do we do in a case like that? We have to respectfully decline. But at the same time, we need to be willing to face the consequences, right? Because we know there will be consequences. But God's going to be with us. I mean, what, what, did, what did the disciples do when the leaders told them not to do what Jesus told them to do? They continued to do it. But they knew there would be consequences. They were arrested. Peter was arrested. But God was with them. And he released them and he protected them until it was time to bring them home. So God will be with us if we put him in front of others. Now, here's, here's another interesting question that arises from this, and that is, are there any situations where we may fight against government, take up arms against government? I mean, because we have examples of that in church history, don't we? And we all like to talk about that when we're talking about this issue. Well, let me tell you, the Puritans and the Scottish Presbyterians believed that there were grounds they prosecuted a war against their king, King Charles I. And why did they do that? Well, it's because Samuel Rutherford in his book, Lex Rex, which means the law is king, argued that when government goes beyond its divine mandate and exercises a tyrannical power, that it may be opposed by another lawful authority. Now get that last point, another lawful authority, okay? It wasn't the people of England that rose up against the king. It was the English parliament that declared war on him, who were elected by the people. Okay? They were another authority, and they were calling this king to account. Same thing was true of the Revolutionary War. It was fought on the same grounds. The Continental Congress declared their independence from England because the king was exercising tyranny over the colonists, right? But what did, how did the king respond to that? Well. He invaded the colonies with his armies to seek to bring them again under subjection. And the armies of, of the colonies fought against them. That was the Revolutionary War. So the point is, there is this authority. There are exceptions to this rule of authority, which we've seen. But we need to remember when the authority exercises its power within its God-given boundaries, we are to submit to it even as Jesus did. And in doing this, we are honoring, we are, we are loving our Heavenly Father. Now, one last question I wanted to ask, and it is this, how can we promote godliness, the godly use of authority in all three of these spheres? Okay, how can we promote it? Because it's much easier to submit to it when they're telling you to do the right thing rather than when they're trying to force you to do the wrong thing. So what can we do to try to encourage the right thing? Well, I think the first two are kind of no-brainers. In the family, husbands and wives need to live, well, they need to be in the Word. They need to be in prayer. They need to be pursuing the Lord. Parents do as well, that we might be sanctified, that we might love, be filled with God's love, and be able to love so that we can care for those under authority or respect authority depending upon which relationship we're in. In the church, we need to make sure that we're uh, putting qualified men in office according to the standards given us in 1 Timothy 3 and Titus 1. And we need to be praying for our church leaders. But then the big question, what about government? How can we promote godliness in our government? Well, first of all, we do need to be praying for them. Paul says to Timothy in 1 Timothy 2, verses 1 through 4, First of all, then, I urge that entreaties and prayers, petitions and thanksgivings be made on behalf of all men, for kings 
and all who are in authority so that we may lead a tranquil and quiet life in all godliness and dignity. Okay, we do need to be praying. We can exercise our right to vote. You know, we, we live in a democracy and we can make our opinions known at the ballot box, but the problem with that is we might find ourselves hard pressed to find any candidates that we can support with a clear conscience. Okay, that's the problem with that. Or we can run for office. And if we gain that office, we can use that authority to begin to initiate changes. We can do that. But there's a problem with that too. You can only go so far before you're voted out of office because people don't like the way you're governing. Because the problem is there's so many people who don't like godliness, right? So I think the most effective way, and I'm not saying we don't do these others, we do those, but there's a more effective way. Well, prayer is the most effective way, but there's a long-term strategy. We should pray that God would advance His kingdom through the gospel. You know, there's, there's differing views of, uh, in, in post-millennial circles, you know, that with the more optimistic view that things are going to change, and there's differing ways that they conceive of how that's going to happen. Uh, I believe those that are called Reconstructionists um, think more along the lines of this. Let's take over government and impose it, okay? Well, again, we need to vote people into office, perhaps pursue office, and need to try to influence policy. But in the long term, that's going to fail because the people in the, a democracy are going to reject it. So the other method is to evangelize the people, okay? Evangelize the people, get them to repent, it, well, by God's grace, turn to Christ, or as we're praying for the work of evangelism, pray for revival that God would subdue their hearts, and then the people would desire godly leadership. Then, then we'll see candidates who may actually qualify for this office and lead us in godliness because it's only if the hearts of the people change that they're going to desire that kind of leadership. I hope you see that that is the case. Now, <clears throat> the important question is this. Do we have any reason at all to believe that that could ever possibly happen? You know, that, that people's hearts would change to the point where there would be godly leadership. Well, yes, we do have, I think, indications in Scripture that give us optimism. That, that's why, again, I'm I, I am a, a post-millennialist. You know, I, I'm more optimistic. That doesn't mean I think things are going great right now. That's not what, I, that's not what that means. But the things are going to get better. Why? Okay. Well, the Father promised that He's going to subdue all of Christ's enemies under His feet. And that that is a progressive thing that has started from the time he was enthroned to the present day and until the last enemy is subdued. The Bible says, Paul tells us in Philippians 2, one day every knee is going to bow before King Jesus. And Jesus tells us in the Lord's Prayer to pray that his kingdom would advance and that his commandments would be obeyed on earth as it is in heaven. In the Great Commission, he sends his disciples out to disciple the nations, not, you know, to save a few people out of the nations, but to disciple the nations, to teach them godliness so that the kingdom of Christ would expand. What did the angels sing when Jesus was born? Peace on earth, goodwill to men. Now, this, again, it's been 2,000 years. Um, things may not be shaping up the way we'd like to see them, um, but as... Um, those who are of this persuasion would, would say, we're still a lot further ahead than we were in first century Palestine when there was Jesus and 12 disciples, okay? The, the church has spread quite a bit more. There, there are many more people and it's continuing to grow. So I think it will happen. But unless the Lord does something extraordinary, I don't think it's going to happen in our lifetime. So what do we do in the meantime? We need to remain faithful. We need to continue to live like Christ in the world and shine the light of the gospel in the world. And we need to, in the meantime, as Abraham, who looked forward, you know, to that city which God had prepared, we need to look forward by faith to see these promises fulfilled in Christ as an encouragement to us to keep moving forward because the battle that we're fighting is not a losing battle. It is a battle that's already been won. Okay? The war has been won, and we just simply need to be faithful in moving ahead in faith that the Lord is going to accomplish these things.
Well, may the Lord give us grace to do so. Let's, um, let's bow in a moment of prayer. And let's pray that God would give us grace to hear what he's said to us uh, this morning. And at the same time, prepare to come to the table.